you very much, uh, Suraj. So, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, intermediary liability can sound a little complex uh, in in uh, maybe in its definition, but it really means something far more deep and, in a way, personal. It it is to do with the content we consume, uh, the content we share, and whether. Uh, particularly if there's something wrong, anyone else has a right to govern it, and if so, in what way. And there are many, many instances that we can see right around us right now, uh, which bring this whole issue to fore in perhaps ways that we could have never imagined before. So I'm not going to go much deeper into this. We've got an amazing panel of experts to talk about it. What we're going to do is uh, e uh, ask each of them to speak for about uh, three or four minutes each to look at this issue from their vantage point, uh, wherever they are, and, uh, in, and uh, on, or how they've been perhaps approaching it or working on it in the past. And after which we will have a discussion and where we will also uh, be open to your questions and comments. And of course, we invite you to uh, wholeheartedly do so. So on that note, let me uh, kick off uh, with uh, Michi Chaudhary, who joins us from uh, New York being, I'm guessing, the furthest from where we are, at least geographically, <laughs> but digitally, of course, we're all right next to each other. Over to you, Mishi. Thank you, Govindranj. Um, yeah, I'm the one Over fueled you, with coffee. Thank you, Govindranj. Um, yeah, I'm the one fueled with coffee in your cocktail hour. So uh, pardon me if I'm really prolonging uh, your going to drinks and having dinner. Um, yes, it's a word salad, a complicated topic uh, for sure. And uh, of course, uh, people like us and the other panelists who spend uh, uh, quite a few days working on this, it seems as if this is the be all and the end all of the world. Um, but for the rest of you who have uh, come to depend on a lot of social media platforms and have now at least beginning to figure out why there is so much problems and uh, why uh, there are only a few actors who uh, are being blamed, whether it is in a documentary on any of your favorite OTT platforms or everyday newspapers. Um, in India and in other advanced societies, governments and courts are now beginning their reckoning with the extraordinary difficulties which are posed by the presently existing centralized social media and the platform companies. The big names you are all familiar with, uh, I don't need to name them. And um, these platform companies by operating these media are changing human civilization. They surveil the daily social behavior of billions of individuals, including us. Um, they read their email, they spy on their social interactions, they present them edited news feeds, and personalized advertising. They keep track of everything we read and watch. And the companies have acquired a breadth and depth of social power over um, our impulses and uh, behavior patterns that um, exceed any similar form of influence, private or public, in human history. And this has all, of course, happened in the blink of an eye on the time scale of history, uh, barely more than a decade. Um, the Apple iPhone only came in 2007, we're in 2020. The power of these technology platform companies to amplify human emotions, to generate outrage and then stoke anger, to channel that aggression above all, to move goods and merchandise, because we're always told, oh, it's only advertising. They're only selling us what we want to buy. It leaves the more traditional powers of law and government uh, staggering, deeply unsure how to respond to all of these problems. India has been both a pioneer in the human costs and benefits of social media. Uh, it is obviously because these are American platform companies. So until the 2016 US election happened, everybody can just live or pretend that mm, the rest of the world doesn't exist, despite the fact that uh, most of their users are outside the United States. Um, and as I said, we have been a pioneer in the human costs and benefits of social media and uh, between the new forces and laws. We've uh, recently seen that the controversy over content moderation at Facebook has descended into personalities, which has eclipsed the larger and more important issues, which is what Govindrat said that is the topic here. All these benefits happen, but they're also the havoc we have wrecked. Um, how do you actually control this? Every time you try to control something, then there are these issues about users' rights. And then there are, of course, conflicting issues from the law enforcement also. 
the companies actually can exist only because the law ignores the bad consequences of their action, which it has never done for other publishers. Newspapers or broadcasters who publish harmful lies that cause harm to people in their lives face important legal consequences, not at the hand of the state, but because law provides private citizens protection against those wrongs. Now, the platform companies have succeeded in placing themselves outside this sphere of mutual responsibility. They hide behind their users again. And uh, But uh, when we talk about policy, we also see that Indian tech policy has changed rapidly and arbitrarily in its attempt to serve two conflicting goals. They want to encourage innovation, and uh, we also want to com have complete control of public discourse to the benefit of uh, the political masters. So history is witness to the fact that innovation happens in places where policies impacting businesses are certain and predictable, and also freedom to think is expressly protected. Uh, these are difficult issues, uh, whether it is the European Union or it is the United States or it is uh, a very different kind of uh, People's Republic of China, Russia, I Iran. Um, they're all grappling with some form of this or the other. They don't want the companies to be responsible for the content you and I generate and put on social media. But each of these country countries' uh, rule of law systems are different. Politics is different. The use by political parties is very different and how the users react also are very different. That's why just aping what one jurisdiction may do in another one doesn't work at all. So um, I would say that uh, just like a lawyer's, uh, my training has been always to say it depends on the facts. Everything is complicated. Pay me more money and I will tell you the solutions. Uh, but um, that doesn't serve anybody. So here are uh, other people who are far smarter, younger, uh, well-equipped to answer these uh, issues than I am. So with that, I would end what I had to say and uh, over to the others. Quick point. I mean, so you are essentially saying that, for instance, you use the example of newspapers. You are saying that platforms should be on par with newspapers when it comes to liability. Ah, I wish it was that simple if I could just put it in one sentence. I will say that the platform companies at the beginning of uh, the early aughts or how we saw when they came into power, they were very different. They have now become a very different animal also. If most of our news is going to come through these platform companies, we will have to change how we look at them. Uh, I'm not going to say they will always be at power, uh, at par with the other uh, newspapers and publishers, but we will have to par with the understand. other uh, newspapers and publishers. But we will have to understand how each interme intermediary works. The unfortunate part, at least in Indian law, is that a cyber cafe or a telecom service provider or a platform company, they're all clubbed together in one definition, which is an intermediary. So you cannot really have a kind of regulatory system, which is not very burdensome, which also let us use these platform companies the way we would like to use their platforms to express ourselves and the companies to operate. So um, uh, there is definitely scope that some of these companies might, in certain businesses that they operate, they will have to be um, at least uh, subject to some regulation which looks like that. Right, and and it Forms is interesting. When it comes and I to, uh, jurisdiction. Okay. Well, uh, the laws definitions are such. Right. Okay. Udbhav Tiwari, you're next. Thanks, Govind. I think I'm going to just take this time and uh, take like I think the excellent framing that Mishi's given us so far, and broadly talk about uh, a little more constructively, like the need to evolve essentially beyond this question of pure liability that this debate has now been focused on uh, for a fair number of years, right? Like, because I think that the term intermediary liability of itself has a lot of connotation and it fundamentally states when should platforms be held responsible for actions that users perform on them and when platforms also sometimes maybe even modify speech by amplifying it, by moderating it and by making it sort of like either come up more prominently or less prominently in their respective services. Uh, and really start looking at the question of responsibility and accountability, right? Because I think liability is important, but liability really frames the debate as a sort of black and white uh, you either have liability or you don't, and there is no real sort of like notion of what can platforms do in that sliding scale between doing absolutely nothing at all 
and having uh, because they have complete immunity to then not having immunity at all. And I think there are tons of things that need to be explored there. So I'll, I'll go a little bit into those ideas of responsibility, of accountability, uh, and then also talk about in passing some sort of like fairly complex issues like end-to-end -end encryption that are interfacing with intermediary liability and finally look at the Digital Services Act in the European Union uh, mm -hmm. and how and look at how some other countries are sort of dealing with these issues and what India should be able uh, to sort of learn from them and what can we do to sort of like evolve our intermediary liability regime uh, as well. Uh, so before I start, like just for context, uh, the Indian government itself has been considering amending the intermediary liability regime now for almost uh, a period of two years, like I think it'll be two years this December. And uh, the conversation there has again always been focused uh, a fair bit on liability where uh, there are like the amendments propose a set of fairly harsh criteria, like such as the fact that you need to take content down that you're told to within a period of uh, 24 hours, you need to make sure that uh, whenever there's a law enforcement request, regardless of whether um, of other issues like whether it's valid or not, is it legally sort of sound uh, to respond to it in 72 hours and a bunch of other things like that, right? So uh, like in, in a context where the debate is very much on a, creating a set of like hard bound rules, uh, which if you don't follow, you will not enjoy liability anymore. I think we can evolve the conversation to responsibility and accountability, where responsibility itself is how do we hold the platforms responsible for their actions, right? And I think that uh, we often overlook the rule, uh, the role that process itself plays in content moderation, which is a sort of like fundamental issue of intermediary liability, such as uh, how quickly is content taken down? What is the role of diversity as well as local national context in the decisions that a platform takes? Are there avenues for appeal available? Is there public documentation? All of these are questions that we traditionally definitely ask, ask governments around us and ask the judicial system around us. And I think that um, like it's clear that the previous model where a company could be completely opaque about how it performs many of these actions is simply not sustainable anymore because so many of the functions that they carry out are much closer to being public in nature than in the past, right? And then because of that, uh, there are lots of process-oriented changes that I think both in law as well as in industry practice will go a very long way in helping make sure that platforms exercise the responsibility for the power and the influence and reach that they have a lot more effectively. Um, and then I think the second question is that of accountability, which is what can be done when platforms aren't consistently responsible or don't exercise this burden of responsibility. And I think that uh, that's where that sliding scale that I said, where liability is probably on one extreme and an absolute immunity is on one extreme end uh, lies, right? And I think that there are lots of measures that one can carry out that allow for the freedom of expression to be maintained because at the end of the day, if you impose liability upon platforms, it becomes very clear that platforms will start subscribing to individuals with power and influence of society so that they can take content down, right? Like if a platform has to take content down within 24 hours and will not enjoy liability anymore, then whenever a government tells you to take a piece of content down, it will take it down because without that, it would be legally liable for it. And right now, uh, like platforms have the ability to sort of take a little more time with such content to like sort of deliberate in their internal processes and even sometimes get external advice that helps them decide how to act with content. And I think it's important to recognize therefore the role that uh, intermediate liability plays on maintaining freedom of expression online so that platforms aren't co coerced to follow the whims of, of the governments uh, and the countries in which they operate. But I think that like in that sliding scale in between, uh, just taking an example of transparency reports, right? Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and like tons of other very big platforms, including uh, e-commerce platforms uh, such as Airbnb, uh, and Amazon all come out with transparency reports and transparency reports are essentially uh, reports that platforms put up saying these are the actions that we carried out for intellectual property enforcement for law enforcement takedown for violations of our community guidelines for violations of our terms and service and put all of this information up in the public domain. This is a relatively recent phenomenon that I think is about now approximately eight to nine years old from when it started, but has had a remarkable sort of like, uh, like I think ins has given lots of people remarkable insight into how these platforms actually operate. So because of that, like this question of responsibility, the accountability, exploring how transparency reports can evolve, I think is a very useful uh, angle. And uh, if like uh, both members in the panel as well as the audience are, are interested in some of these questions of responsibility and accountability, uh, the Digital Services Act just concluded its sort of uh, public consultation. The European Union is an excellent way where many companies have made uh, and civil society organizations and think tanks their proposals for how intermediary liability should be evolved public while keeping liability at its core, right? So things like classifying intermediaries, where uh, the rules that apply to an e-commerce intermediary for intellectual property violation 
versus a cyber cafe, like Mishi said, do versus an online platform like a Facebook or a YouTube, are fun fundamentally should be different. And there's no reason to sort of club them all together while keeping the fact that like they are shielded from liability as long as they responsible that they exercise their responsibility in an accountable manner. So that, I think there are some really interesting conversations that I'm looking forward to sort of bring them up in the rest of the discussion. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Udbhav. Uh, Smita, it's over to you. Thanks, Kuvan. Um, and thank you. I'm going to, I think, uh, take off a little bit from uh, what both Udbhav and Nishi mentioned uh, in, in their remarks um, and discuss a little more in detail uh, what, uh, what is happening in India in terms of the policy making or the lawmaking process uh, and some of the issues in that context, right? Um, so as Udbhav mentioned, um, India is, and Nishi as well mentioned, I think India is one of the many, many countries that's like looking to rejig existing law on intermediary liability um, to account for like several new problems that have uh, cropped up since I think 2011 was when uh, the, the, the current rules came into effect. These rules are under the Information Technology Act uh, based on, uh, again, amendments that were made to the Information Technology Act in 2008. So it's really been a while. And the way um, intermediaries, the way social media platforms especially function has changed considerably since then. Uh, and the impact that they have as well has changed considerably. Um, but I think one of the, the, the key criteria when we're looking to uh, redo this law, so to speak, um, has to be that, you know, one of the issues is that identification of what problems we're trying to solve is not easy in itself. Um, so in 2018, when the government proposed that they would amend the existing rules, they broadly said that they intended to kind of tackle the issue of fake news and misinformation and the circulation of obscene con uh, content on social media platforms. Um, however, one of the main points of criticism at the time for this uh, amendment was that they didn't they, they failed to explain why these specific changes that they were proposing uh, were needed to address these issues and why, uh, of course, as uh, Mishi mentioned, you know, all intermediaries, whether it's telecom service providers, cyber cafes, uh, online payment uh, providers, uh, e-commerce sites, should all be covered under these. Uh, broad amendments that were specifically supposed to be targeted at misinformation on social media platforms. Um, so I think it's kind of key to remember, uh, you know, that there is no one problem. Each of these kind of intermediaries will be facing, the, we will be facing different problems of regulation in each of these, in relation to each of these intermediaries. Um, and that's at best, at least like a series of problems that any amendment to this law needs to address. Uh, so just Taking a step back, the way this law works is that uh, it gives, if, if, if intermediaries follow certain due diligence requirements, uh, so they post some sort of terms of uh, use, some sort of privacy policy and some other information, they are not liable for the content that their users put up on the website or the platform itself, right? Um, and I think the first question in that context is what kind of content should be regulated at all? Uh, and this is fairly well established if you look at, uh, you know, both Indian law as well as if you look at international human rights law, there is a, it's fairly well established, first of all, that the same rights that are available to you offline should be available to you online. So if you have the freedom of speech and expression offline in the traditional world, pre-internet world, that should be available to you online as well. And then if you look at the specific laws or regulations on content itself, um, there are many buckets of restricted speech or prohibited speech under Indian law. Uh, it could be hate speech, it could be obscene content, defamatory content. And each of these has very like vastly differing standards uh, that, they, that that particular piece of content needs to meet in order to be prohibited or restricted, right? Um, and the ideal um, kind of situation is that this is determined by a court. Uh, although the amendments that, was, that were proposed in 2018 itself tried to kind of expand the scope of what illegal content is. Um, most social media platforms also have guidelines on what kind of content is allowed, what kind of speech is allowed on their uh, platforms itself. And this is often a mix of very, uh, you know, no, different standards adopted by different countries. Uh, but typically what happens under these kind of laws or uh, regulations is that the person who actually speaks or posts the content is liable under law. And it requires criminal prosecution to hold them liable under law as well. So again, it was fine to say this in the early days of the internet when these intermediaries were considered, I mean, the concept comes up from the, this idea that intermediaries are just a conduit, they're a dumb pipe that just 
enable you to communicate with each other, but not they don't do anything to modify the content or amplify the content. Um, but of course, I think that brings us to the second problem statement that um, you know Udbhav already alluded to. Um, that it's you know how do you deal with the fact that there are so many um, there's algorithms, there's business models, there's a range of uh, thing uh, you know technical as well as business um, kind of practices that platforms, social media platforms especially adopt to amplify specific kinds of content today. Uh, so how do you deal with that uh, issue and how do you hold them accountable for that kind of content while ensuring that the individual person is, uh, who, uh, you know, their freedom of speech and expression is protected where it's legal content and it's restricted where it's not legal content. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of questions in this context about whether when they have knowledge of this, when they don't have knowledge of this kind of content, uh, whether just because they're amplifying it using the algorithms, that means that they should be reliable. There's a lot. Of, there's a bunch of very complex questions to be answered, and I don't know if there is any one answer to that either. It, again, like it does depend a lot upon the situations and things like that. And I think that brings us to the third question of, um, you know, how should we differentiate between different kinds of intermediaries? This was already discussed a little bit by both Ubhav and Mishi, so I won't go into it. Uh, but again, it's not something that our laws or our policy making processes currently uh, address. And then there's of course like a much bigger problem of um, you know, control. Uh, the, ki the kind of amendments that have been proposed right now uh, do will tend to restrict freedom of speech and expression, will tend to restrict your right to privacy quite heavily because not necessarily on it, at an indi individual level where you know they'll pick out a piece of content and say, you can't say this or like something like that, but also just asking for things like um, broad automated processes where companies monitor everything that you're saying online to see if it could be illegal. Uh, that kind of changes, like flips the, the way you're looking at it. It flips the way you look at content to assume that everything could be illegal and then if it passes that test, it's legal. So uh, it's just a chilling effect on speech and uh, things like that. So um, I think I'll just stop there. Those right. are, I think, some of the problems that are there, but we can discuss this in detail. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Smita. It's over to you, Vivan. Thanks. Um, I'll just, I think, I'll, the speakers before me have uh, laid it, laid out the framework quite well. I'll just add three elements to it, um, and some of it might be a repetition. But you know, um, the internet was essentially built on a bedrock of trust. And uh, this is why it was an open architecture. Um, it was built on open standards. Uh, and today we see a very real erosion of that trust. Uh, this is not just a feeling that I have, but also uh, empirically validated. There's a survey that I'd recommend all of you look at, which is by the Center of International Governance Innovation, which was in 2019. And the survey was carried out across 24 countries uh, with over 20,000 people involved. And uh, interestingly, social media companies were second only to cyber criminals when it came to fueling online distrust, which is quite shocking. I, I think uh, when we think about any kind of a liability framework, we have to think through the lens of um, harm as well, because there, as people have mentioned, uh, there are heterogeneous uh, group of intermediaries uh, involved from cyber cafes to social media platforms. Um, and most of more than half of those concerned uh, in in the survey uh, were more concerned about online privacy uh, than the previous round of the survey. So it doesn't seem to be the case that some of the solutions that are proffered by uh, some of the intermediaries uh, is building a whole lot of confidence in the online ecosystem, which is a problem because this is the digital economy is going to be the driver of. Uh, economic growth and social change in, in the days ahead. And it is already that. The second uh, frame that I'd like to put on this is that of scale, which is that uh, today you have, um, you know, in the, in the curated content world, um, you know, the, for, for instance, in the film world, the, the CBFC, which is also called a censor board, uh, but is not supposed to censor, uh, looks at about 24,000 pieces of content every year. Uh, which are movies and documentaries and short films and so on. And obviously they don't uh, manage to uh, run through all of them. So some of it is procedural. Uh, but just imagine now on YouTube, you have 500 minutes or 500 hours rather uh, of video being uploaded per minute, uh, which means that if you go in were to watch these videos uh, that were uploaded in the span of a day, 
you would be 83 by the time you were done at the current rate. And of course, 5G and all these exponential network advancements, uh, advancements will, change, will, all, change, change, the will change the game altogether. So, uh, you know, the, the, the sheer amount of scale online uh, of content means that uh, we have to think about how the talking about the point, how, point. how we actually regulate any uh, content creation and, and, and uh, consumption. And uh, I think here, uh, there is a big role that users uh, have to play uh, along with companies and governments. And I think co-regulatory models are very important to look at where, uh, you know, a central regulatory body or a couple of central regulatory bodies could maybe may have the resources to investigate a few complaints. Uh, but overall, you know, you, you, you build foster an environment of transparency and trust where uh, others are able to come in and audit uh, and you can finally escalate to perhaps a, uh, a, an independent ombudsman or a or a comp or a, um, you know a government official or whatever. Uh, but again, these things will vary based on the intermediaries and their scope of harm in the, in the digital digital sphere. Uh, so this heterogeneity again is the third frame, which I think uh, you know the intermediary liability framework is a good framework to actually lay on top of. A whole lot of digital applications. So, in one way, it it's restrictive right now as we have it because, uh, you know, we just we, we tend to talk about content platforms and social media and so on when we think of intermediaries. But again, uh, it's a very broad uh, uh, range of digital applications that actually provide that intermediary service to you too, because you are outsourcing trust to them uh, online as you transact or, uh, or or seek information or communicate. Uh, and I think uh, the intermediary liability framework works actually quite beautifully if you were able to provide, uh, you know, a vertical regulatory structure where you are able to define and classify almost like the GST does uh, new kinds of intermediaries as you go along um, and, and create co-regulatory structures that speak to these and, and, and uh, monitor the, the levels of responsibility that will obviously vary. So just to take an example, just... Uh, on the example of, uh, for instance, gaming. Uh, many wouldn't even be aware uh, today in government that uh, even those within the fold of IT governance, uh, that there are at least four different kinds of uh, gaming applications for, um, uh, uh, for uh, money. And uh, two of those are really large in India today and they're already you know, billion dollar plus industry. So esports is where you have a competition in video gaming skill and you have fantasy sports uh, where you focus on a player's awareness of a sport, like in the case of Dream 11, uh, you, you look at the IPL and so on and so forth. And it's intricacies to make predictions about which athletes will do well and which will lead them to victory and so on. And obviously, even within this narrow classification, ostensibly of gaming, you have a very varied uh, group of intermediaries that are uh, providing you these uh, these services and therefore you may be able to uh, uh, do better uh, for your digital economy if you're if you're actually not constraining them and, and, and putting them in a broad brushstroke under one classification but uh, start to classify them more narrowly uh, and and uh, you know that is the vertical regulation that i'm alluding to Okay, uh, uh, thanks for that, uh, Vivan. Uh, on gaming specifically, so are you saying that when saying they, that when uh, they do, this, uh, do this for money, uh, to I mean to use the same line that you use, are they is that is that within boundaries or is that on the borderline or? Well, I mean, again, so this is the point, right? They don't have legal certainty right now. The the courts decide uh, what is legal and what is not. It should be decided by under a broad definition of. Uh, you know, e-commerce under the IT Act, but we give a passing mention to e-commerce in the IT Act in the preamble. Ostensibly, I mean, really, because when we enacted the IT Act in the early 2000s, in the year 2000, rather, it was essentially an act or a legislation to uh, to to give validity to legal uh, to to digital signatures for legal transactions right. online. And at that time, as most uh, politicians tend to do. Uh, you know, uh, the idea that they should be called an Information Technology Act was so appealing because it, it meant that a greater turf would uh, accrue to the person in charge uh, that it was labeled that. But I really think it's a misnomer. It's by no means an IT Act. In uh, If you look right. at the 
heterogeneity of the digital economy which everyone has spoken about right and and a quick another uh, quick another supplement, uh, to that. supplement to that kazim i'm coming to you so uh, when, when you say that uh, you know bring gaming companies under uh, you talked about this vertical structure are you talking about the games themselves the the uh, what players of those games post or the content that is created uh, i mean can you define that a little more because when i think of let's say the social platforms on which we all engage every day to me there it's clearer i am uh, maybe for our audiences also would like to know in the context yeah, of gaming I mean, there are lots of debates on this and as mishi said uh, maybe we should get paid uh, to chart out uh, some chart. of these frameworks but um, there are elements of uh, uh, communications happening on these platforms that need to be that would fall under a uh, similar sorts of regulation i'm saying don't, don't think of intermediaries narrowly because uh, once you do that uh, don't think of them very broadly and then uh, put a regulatory framework on all of them because they have functionally very different things right. that they're doing for all of us as consumers and uh, i'm not an advocate of functional regulation uh, only because you know you have now multi utility platforms that are doing all sorts of things for the user you're doing the transacting communicating Uh, watching videos etc playing games and so you will perhaps be a part of the game you know uh, you will have avatars of yourself that are moving around different games uh, and the issues around liabilities around all of these areas will become fairly complex all i'm saying is these complex questions can't be resolved by the state alone you need to create as uh, udbhav i think said you need you need procedural uh, uh, clarity on some of these areas and the intermediary liability framework as a framework actually works well for the digital sphere if you can extrapolate it to a wider range of digital applications without being constrained by its origins in free speech right thanks for that uh, kazim it's over to you thanks sir thanks so thanks, thanks goven i think all the speakers have really laid out the ideas and the points really well uh, i just want to sort of broaden this a little bit because i think i've heard all of them a lot of great points from udbhav devan uh, mishi and smita um what we are looking at today and why we having this debate is uh, for the need for an intermediary liability regime which works for all stakeholders right and who are the who stakeholders are? which we are trying to address here so basically two we have the users and then you have the government and then you have the intermediaries in the middle right so when you're looking at users who are using the internet and i mean you've seen the evolution of the internet from uh, early 90s to now and it's basically creating all kind of opportunities for various kind of people across the world one of the key cornerstone of that has been the freedom of users to actually talk on on, on the internet on various issues right so that's something which i think we'll have to be very clear in terms of whatever li- li- intermediary liability regime we need we want the users at the center of that intermediary liability regime and uh, i think vivan really brought that interesting point of trust uh, what is happening now is that public trust is or looking at i mean we're looking at public trust being eroded a little bit because of various uh, rise in hate speech uh, and internet being used for various sorts of uh, purposes so what do we need uh, going ahead uh there are three key things which i just want to touch upon one is we need stronger and robust community guidelines from the intermediaries themselves and i think udbhav touched upon that uh, earlier as well and these guidelines have to be very transparent that we need these uh, intermediaries to apply the same rules for the same type of uh, speech which they're trying to address and that should be transparent and it should be open for people to see i think that's very critical for the trust to come back number 2 is we need to do this while making sure that certain fundamental critical points of a free internet is safeguarded one is end to end encryption which is very important and number 2 is protecting safe harbor because that has been at the center of ensuring that third party content on the internet is generated and people can actually go and publish what they feel is right and then you have a robust community guidelines which then looks at various elements and then monitors them and takes harmful content down as per the guidelines now what we are seeing in india in the last two years is the fact that the state has been pushing for a probably a stronger intermediary liability regime because they want to protect the internet from hate speech and all legitimate concerns but at the cost of giving up on freedom of speech this is something which i think is uh, is a, cha- a problem and quite challenging which is where i think we need to revisit the intermediary liability regime and um, 
a lot of the stakeholders have spoken about it in the past we've also written about it in the past that we need an internet where you are able to take down content but at the same time you're also preserving the rights of the individuals so that's a balance i think which is very important to be drawn uh, right uh, in terms of how we want the intermediary library regime to go ahead another point which i think is critical over here is the fact that uh, when we are looking at maybe the it act might be amended in the future and the government is looking at that is to create a regime where you have all stakeholders coming together and not just the government talking and saying okay this is how we want the internet to be regulated but you would speak to the industry you get the media involved you get the users involved you get civil society involved have a model where you bring in all set of stakeholders to talk about the challenges they face uh, because if we are looking at the debates which are happening globally and some of the i think we might want to touch upon it but what we are seeing in the us with earnet act and the fosta sesta act those are challenges which we are, we will also be seeing in india very soon the fact that uh, government is now looking to break end to end encryption and uh, if you breaking end to end encryption you basically violating the privacy of citizens you are also eroding the trust which people have with technology and you are also exposing them to greater cyber vulnerabilities etc so what 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 do we need in terms of going forward is an internet where you are preserving the privacy of people you're bringing in stronger surveillance laws i think because that's one of the key challenges which we are facing today also that the il regime is not on its own there are multiple set of laws and issues which are interlinked with it uh, you need a strong data protection law in the country to be able to protect the privacy of users uh, you need to build trust with uh, between intermediaries and the citizens with greater transparency at the same time you also need to preserve what the share single judgment spoke about was reactive take down of content and making sure that you don't start filtering content now imagine if this session was uh uh couldn't be telecasted live and you had to sort of first publish it and then look at it from a various angle and then filter whatever is right or wrong and then push it out so the internet doesn't work in that fashion right so we need to be looking at regulations which are not infringing upon the freedom but at the same time how do we make internet a safer place for communities for diverse kind of people for women for lgbt i think that's a important debate that uh, we are seeing right now and those are some of the concerns which are evolving as more and more people are using the internet with the rise with the coming of covid-19 and now internet is basically for every activity you need to be online uh, so how do you make sure that you are keeping this as a safe place but at the same time you don't allow the state to control over control it because at the end of the day if you're looking at automate automatic filtering something which would have mentioned over there what you're really doing is uh, asking the intermediaries to start proactively take down content so basically the platforms become arbiter of truth and morality and we don't want that uh, we we want the users at the center of of the internet and that's something which i think is important to debate Okay, uh, that's uh, uh, very very useful. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Kazib. Just, just, just a quick just a quick question. Uh, you know, you talked about the government breaking end-to-end -end encryption. So that can only happen if uh, the uh, platform in question agrees to it, right? I mean, if they don't or they walk out, then I guess that discussion ends there. So in the 2018 draft, which you mentioned, the government proposed this that uh, traceability is required yeah. for the law enforcement authorities to uh, catch criminals. Now, the one of the key things is that they need data to catch criminals, absolutely. But they already have metadata in terms of IP address, in terms of timestamp, and etc. And that that data is quite a lot for them to actually go and catch criminals and then be able to understand how uh, investigation would work. In fact, some of the work we are doing uh, and the research we have been conducting, we figured that it's actually access to data is not as much as a problem as it is the ability of the state and the police to be able to harness the data available to catch criminals. There's a huge lack of capacity in Indian uh, ecosystem, and there are very few research right. labs in the country when it comes to metadata analytics. So, rather than asking for more and more data, use the existing data to its fullest effect, and that's not happening in India right now. 
So that's very critical. Um, and I just want to sort of mention also the TRAI report, which came out last week and which spoke about the fact that right now is not a good time to regulate and uh, you know look at traceability. So that's a good step forward from TRAI when it comes to uh, regulation of OTTs. But at the same time, we also understand that globally, uh, you're looking at Brazil, which is talking about breaking encryption, you're looking at the Earnet Act. So there is a sense of fear that are we allowing state backdoor access and through that, are we giving uh, our vulnerabilities to non-state actors? Because once you break encryption, uh, the smarter criminals, the technology savvy criminals will always have access to uh, create new uh, chat box and messages where they can sort of communicate with Got each it. other. So this okay. is a very sort of complex issue and there's no silver bullet when it comes to uh, finding out right. or actually making sure that, okay, will we get enough data? Will you actually have a lot of data? What you need to do is train your people and make sure that you're working in a capacity building program where you're able to communicate with everybody and the stakeholders should work with the intermediaries over here. I think that's very critical for intermediaries to work with them and to be able to sort of come up with solutions. Right. Okay. So we've only got about 10 minutes to go now. So let me get some quick, broad uh, viewpoints points on, on what, what should we do and, do how, and we how we should do. So before so that, before Mishi, that Mishi, let me come, let back, me come to back to you. So, uh, so uh, I, I, I could see that at least two or three speakers spoke about uh, con community guidelines, the need for uh, them being strong, transparent, but also uh, it was mentioned that, uh, you know, it needs to be aligned to the country or to that region. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so, um, this is, um, uh, all my friends at the bar are going to hate me, but that's fine. Uh, I'm used to that. I, I, I think we should stop finding solutions that law is going to provide us all the solutions. Stop uh, finding the solutions that law is going to provide us all the solutions. Um, that's the first point I'm going to make. Um, law is constantly catching up with policy and the developments and technology is already two steps ahead of everything which happens. So expecting law to solve our problems is not gonna work. Second, um, I had said it earlier also, jurisdictions are very different. The regular structure of rule of law really has an important bearing on what will happen even in these specific rules. India has a major problem right now uh, of our judiciary is not very much on damages based structure. We love, uh, putting criminal liability on everybody. Oh, let's just go get the CEO arrested for something because if someone did anything wrong. And we do not award damages. That also means that we are far more interested in putting people behind jail and all that other stuff. We don't resolve matters very quickly. And now we are talking, um, and I think uh, Vivan mentioned about the scale of the content, which is unprecedented. It's just not gonna be possible. Second thing I'm going to say is each time, whether it is the UPA government, which came up in 2011, or when uh, the current ruling party was vehemently opposed, but obviously when you come in power, things uh, right somehow become something different. So, uh, or these current 2018 guidelines. Law has become a, just a tool to use something uh, which is censorship by proxy. I will not censor it because you can come and take me to court as state because you have justiciable rights against me. Why don't I just tell the companies to censor you? And I would say that some of the revelations which have come up from one particular company tell us a little bit more about what we were naively expecting or which is not to be true. To say that those guidelines would address misinformation and WhatsApp, all of us know how um, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging services like WhatsApp or social media has been weaponized by a lot of political parties. So who are they catching and what they're catching? It's just all of this is moonshine from my point of view. And as I said, law is not going to be able to address all our problems. That's why uh, the poor user is actually stuck. Here is a state whose job it is to actually check these companies as well as protect the user rights but is weaponizing it and behind the scenes is also telling these companies to do what works for them. And here are the companies who let us not forget the business model is that you and I behave for the platform. They collect data and then whether it is advertising or it is other collection of data and sharing about profile information, they don't sell data. That is the business model. So how can they not push this nonsense about free speech and expression because that's where they can actually hide. Um, so that is 
So Twitter was the prime originator of this idea that oligopoly of surveillance publishing was the protector of free speech. They were the free speech wing of the party. Uh, but once Mark Zuckerberg proclaimed that politicians' right to lie on Facebook was a basic part of the system of human rights, then what we are currently witnessing in all their gossipy reek with sinister background music became inevitable. So that's the third one. Uh, uh, then fourth, I would say is takedown of content is very different from pre-screening of content. Any democracy, even ours, which has a reasonable restriction and not the US kind First Amendment, also is going to throw it out of court if the courts actually function. Uh, so we are not asking for that pre-screening of the content, but the content can be taken down. And that's why what European Union is moving towards is a system where there can be, if you flag something, if there is a problem, it does get taken down. Why is there a discrimination? Why shouldn't you be asked to um, explain and operate? Then I would say is that, um, and that's why I'm a little dubious in my the complete trust and belief in these co-regulatory structures where uh, the business model is not recognized and which lights this outrage. And then I would say is that quick, ill-considered solutions are very, very attractive, often demanded by a lot of people, but it doesn't really work. Um, despite the importance of our judgments, our laws, our democracy, the courts themselves, the Kerala High Court once asked this thing about that, why can't um, Justice Gupta said, oh, we just cannot get away by saying that we don't have the technology. If there is technology to do it, then there ought to be a technology to stop it. Go find me solutions. Now, these ill-considered, quick things, hard problems are hard. There are no silver bullet questions. That's why you have all of us rambling about some complicated method, no matter which solution you ask for, we all will have some pros and some cons to weigh in on it. Um, I think one of the things which is a consensus definitely is perhaps that all intermediaries are not the same. They are different companies. They've also metamorphosized into something very different as they not, didn't start with. Um, and uh, not last, but the, uh, I mean, uh, what I would say is that um, they are, these companies like to say, or we like to say, there are mere conduits, but they are not mere, mere conduits in any way. Constantly, they have to negotiate with political power, especially in countries like ours. And there are a lot of, there is already a lot of data, whether it is child pornography, whether it is copyright infringement, whether it is terrorist content, which they already take down. The right. mechanisms are there. We need to distinguish between whether it is pre-screening we are talking about or takedown mechanisms Shri and transparency. Question. You know, discuss this a little more, but we are right. uh, so, very short on time now. So what I'm going to do is ask each of the speakers. So, you know, I think the issues have been very, very broadly and uh, very, very succinctly laid out. Uh, and it's, I, I don't think we have the time now to, you know, pick up some of those. I mean, and really, really interesting uh, points to debate. So what I'm going to ask uh, each of you, and I'm, let uh, let me ask uh, uh, Smita to kick off, is that, and only a minute or so, is what do we do now? You know, so we know all the issues. Each Every speaker has showcased, uh, they, uh, you know, what is the priority from their point of view, whether it is uh, uh, creating, uh, you know, an omnibus structure of law, uh, improving the quality of content moderation uh, guidelines, uh, ensuring that the user is at four, mm -hmm. Uh, protecting the rights of the user, providing safe harbor. So I think we know, I think the issues are now on the table. So how do we, what do we do now? What What's the next step that we should be doing in order to evolve something that in a way addresses or at least encompasses the points that have been uh, put on the table today? So uh, Smita, why don't you go first? And this is a very short one. Sure. I think, I mean, there's a, a couple of different things, definitely at least that are required. One is if you're looking at it from a policy and legal perspective, um, you know, you need uh, long-term thinking on this. You need uh, consultation. You need research to go into and, and this idea of evidence-based policy making, which has come up in many different aspects in our country uh, in the past in the past couple of years. Um, and you know, very uh, meaningful consultations on these issues and things like that. Um, it's I think an idealistic ask, but I think as the the more we move towards that, the uh, the, the better position we're in. And on the other hand, of course, I think, as Mishi mentioned, this is not something that can solve all problems. One of the uh, things just for the, the viewers out there, um, you know, you see a lot of these campaigns and things like that, especially in the U.S., but also in India. You see the Stop Hate for Profit campaign that's been going on in the, uh, in the U.S. and thing, uh, 
just i think demanding more of the companies uh, who business, whose businesses you uh, subscribe to and uh, uh, you know pay for and things like that maybe is one small thing that everybody can do at least uh, and i'm sure there are many other solutions and i will let the others uh, get to those right uh, thanks for that uh, udav uh, your your take and uh, what needs to be done now what can we do uh, in a more pragmatic fashion at this point uh thanks govind i th- i think that like the one minute version of that answer is i think that like both parties need to come to a middle ground like i mean i think many of the, the positions, positions that platforms have taken are reasonable but there are also some that are fairly unreasonable uh with regard to how we, how like say extreme the safe harbor should be what measures of accountability one can impose upon them and a lot of this comes from like free speech jurisprudence in the united states that i think uh is frankly unapplicable for the world at large and and i think that like governments also need to come to that middle ground that like says okay we will understand that like going after liabilities is an extreme step that we will only do if you've consistently shown behavior that showcases you haven't sort of carried out your responsibility in a manner that that um, is of interest and like and whenever that will happen to happen like judges should be involved and and like these seem like sort of like very radical ideas for many part of this context but like in some parts they're already present in different laws all over the world and even in india's law so i think it's more about having a frank and honest conversation ensuring that the regime which has to involve like i think everybody agrees that it shouldn't stay the way it is uh, accounts for the modern internet in the way that it is growing and definitely tries to achieve a balancing act between the interests of the government the interests of the platforms and above all the interests of the users at large right so government platforms and users, users uh, and 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 the convergence to the extent that's possible kazim uh so i think uh, three things i think three things very clearly uh, one on the intermediary side stronger committee guidelines which are uniformly applied and transparent in nature and they evolve with time and how do that, we do that we do that by bringing in the users to sort of uh engage with the intermediaries so greater interaction between users and intermediaries as well to actually comment like if if i am using a platform i should be able to say look these guidelines are not effective enough change this change that you know so i should be able to question that so greater communication i think there's no there's very less communication between the user and the intermediary so that's one two is building state capacity because for law enforcement purposes and i think gamishi also sort of brought about we been sort of told many times that this is important or that is important but i think at the same time uh, what are you going to do with all the information you still have so do you have the capacity to solve crimes and to be able to solve the challenges with the existing data set that is important so i think building state capacity is critical and i think at the the third point is just making sure that you know you preserve the right of individuals to be able to say what they want to say uh, at the same time making sure that you are giving enough freedom and enough room for diverse speeches to come on the internet uh and speeches from different uh, ecosystem from different communities from different kinds of people so make the it's the responsibilities of the intermediaries is a responsibility but maybe not a liability to make sure that you give enough room for all kind of speeches at the same time you're also preserving the right of the people who are talking and of course you're making sure that the state has enough capacity to be able to do what it wants to do. right right and and that sounds uh, that's a very noble objective or a set of uh, objectives uh, uh, kazim it i wish to be noble noble yes, in, 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 I, wish, I, i wish things are line like that but okay vivan uh, uh, your last word to you so i mean you also talked about you know the erosion of trust i mean is that something you ever see coming back and we even foresee that i am um... i'm a uh, i think pessimist in intellect but i'm an optimist in spirit so i don't have an answer on that question uh, that is very straight line depends on what you think about larger problems and how humanity is going to solve them i don't think trust in social media platforms quite qualifies at the level of climate change and other issues so um, i think it will follow from how we uh, address other existential issues in some sense but just on the on the central question of where do we go from here i i i think that incrementalism may not work what it will lead to is jurisdictional overlaps and confusion between regulatory remits and you see that already in india with the possibility of six digital regulators in different avatars uh which is obviously going to lead to uh, erosion of trust and disputes and erosion of value and so on and uh, the 1 trillion dollar digital economy target will elude us 
um so therefore you know as the other speakers have said there are principles and values that exist proportionality gradation etc that we have to use as the bedrock to build this trust and we have to understand that it is in our self interest to do so because the digital market that is in india is not just a market that is for domestic consumption it is one that is integrated uh, inexorably with the global market and india's uh, economic targets um need to be met through digitalization and digital market access and market access will be a function of common values and common prin- principles that uh, can guide you know certain business investments right uh, thanks very much for that vivan thank uh, thank uh, thank you to all of you for uh, your really uh, insightful thoughts uh, on a very complex subject but one uh, like i think is very very real affects us all uh it affects our ability to say what we want our ability to express our thoughts and feelings and our ability to feel uh as uh, i think kazim said uh, a sense of safe harbor as we do that particularly uh here right now in the world's largest democracy so on that note thank you very much uh, uh, and a good evening to you and let me hand it back to suraj and the organizers uh, organizers uh, with my own thanks for inviting me to uh, be part of this discussion